And so I think if you can learn to trust your child, and of course, maturity becomes a factor. Like you can't trust a two-year-old not to run out in the road in front of a truck, right? You got to hold their hand or grab them by the shirt or whatever. But as the child grows up, if you trust your child to make decisions for themselves about what they want to learn and how and who they want to learn it with and all those kinds of things, that's a very helpful step to get away from the kind of control freakish parent mode. Also, I really believe that like reading some basic information about how people learn and what motivates people can also be helpful as a threshold because it gives parents a little bit of a sense of security because it's fear that I really think holds parents back. As a young mother, I experienced a paradigm shift that transformed how I saw education and ultimately the world around me. I started this podcast, The Luminous Mind, to connect with and learn from people who are disrupting the status quo in how they learn, educate, and live in the world around them. Prepare for a paradigm shift. Light a candle. Light your world. Benjamin Franklin said, instead of cursing the darkness, light a candle. You're listening to The Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Mark Beaumont. Mark Beaumont is a professional educator that is passionate about self-directed learning. He's the middle school principal at an international school in Cambodia. Mark is an artist, husband, and father. His daughter attends the school he works at, and even though she attends school, Mark raises her with the principles of self-directed learning. He finds it nothing less than fascinating and challenging. With his professional background and experience, as well as the story and his personal struggles in school, Mark offers great perspective. In his book, Unschool Yourself First, A Parent's Gateway to Self-Directed Learning, he reminds us that it is important to unschool yourself first. He is currently developing a course for Peaceful Parenting University, which will focus on the question, how to unschool. Welcome, Mark. Hi. Thanks for having me on, Rebecca. I'm so excited to have you on. I think your book, Unschool Yourself First, really fits the direction that I'm hoping to you know, have our podcast go more, that we as parents and as educators are working more on ourselves and trying to work on our children because uh, that's somewhat disrespectful <laughs> in some ways and then yeah. uh, works against us in other ways. So. But before we get into anything about your book or the course that you're developing or anything like that, go ahead and give our audience a little bit of background information about yourself. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, you know, I'd call myself a professional educator. I've been in education for, you know, about 20 years um, with a couple of breaks. And uh, I've spent most of the last 20 years actually living in Asia, in Thailand. I'm in Cambodia now. I've lived in Taiwan. And I'm also an artist and a musician. You know, I went to college. Uh, well, before I went to college, I used to work in the rock and roll industry. So I have a healthy rock and roll streak and background. But then, you know, I was actually just, uh, you know, like driving around. We were playing with the Almond Brothers and Little Feet and Jerry Garcia in the summer of 1990. And, you know, I was basically roading. I just got tired of that. I'm like, I'm going to college. And that's how I ended up getting into a professional, <laughs> professional life. I was like, this rock and roll stuff's great, but I don't know if I'll live very long if I keep doing it. So I better get a career going. So anyway, uh, you know, I, I'm a guitarist, ukulele. I'm a, a potter um, when it comes to, you know, my visual arts. You know, but I consider myself an educator first and foremost. I'm a middle school principal of an international school here, uh, CIA First International School in Phnom Penh, not the Central Intelligence Agency. It's uh, Cambodia <laughs> Academy. Important distinction to make. I am definitely not CIA. Um, I'm married. Uh, my wife is Thai. We have a 15-year-old daughter. So, you know, I'm from New England. I'm, I'm a Mainer, as they call it. So that's kind of a nutshell of who I am. That's awesome. Now you're living, you're from the United States, from Maine, New, New yep. England area. Yep. How did you end up in Cambodia? Good question. Actually, uh, I was working at a, a school in Maine, uh, the Wayne Fleet School, a little private school. And I started as a pottery teacher, maybe guitar teacher too, in the summertime, just at the summer camp. And we resonated very well. And so they hired me on uh, the next year to do like kind of a hodgepodge of things. I was teaching guitar. Uh, I was teaching 
uh, the after school program. And then I was kind of the on call substitute. And I, I really loved that job. But I, um, before that, I had started a degree at Goddard College and I was studying um, Chinese philosophy and, and, and ceramics. So I was really into like, you know, I, I met this, my physical science teacher uh, when I was in years ago, I went to Landmark College, which is a whole different thing. But he invited me to a lecture and I thought it was going to be science, but he lectured on Buddhism and it really fascinated me. So I got into this, you know, studying at Goddard. And then I, I went to art school at the University of Maine. And when I was working, I was just, you know, I was like, I want to go to Asia and I want to check out a Buddhist culture. And, I, you know, I'm not any one religion. Um, I grew up in a, in a Christian family. My father's a, a retired Baptist minister. So I grew up in the church and there's all kinds of wonderful stuff in Christianity and Buddhism. And pretty much all the religions have some cool stuff if you go digging around in them. Yeah. So I decided to move over to Thailand. I went, I moved to Thailand in 2002 and got a, a, a English teaching certificate thinking that's how you did things over here. And then discovered the international school community and people were like, oh, I'm making X amount of money. They pay my rent and they fly me home every year. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I gotta get on that program because this teaching English thing, it's like, I can't save money and da da da. So anyway, that's how I ended up over here was I came over to be an English teacher and then was just so fell in love with living it. I mean, there's so much more freedom over here. It was like, I felt like Lord of the Flies, like when the kids realize there's no adults <laughs> and they start running naked on the beaches or whatever they did. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. And so I just stayed over in Asia and I'm, I'm actually moving to New Hampshire in, in August for a new job at a boarding school there. Very exciting opportunity. But I, I'm actually kind of in some ways looking at America right now and I'm kind of dreading uh, <laughs> the, the American part. No offense to my American brothers and sisters. I love you all. But man, you've got a messed up country. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. We're Facebook friends. And I think that we hold the same views on a few things. Yeah, so I've noticed. That's, that's interesting. Well, I know you sound like an unconventional person. So maybe this question seems kind of silly. But as a professional educator, because you have been educated that way, tell me how you ended up in this passion of self-directed learning. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when I first got into education, I was, you know, just as I would say indoctrinated as everybody else. And I thought you had to be kind of an authoritarian jerk to get <laughs> things done correctly. And I was never, I mean, I'm not a mean spirited guy, but I was kind of like, you know, more traditional minded, you know, I've never been a punitive minded person, you know, but I kind of did the more typical thing. And then you know, when I was teaching English, I just started to experiment and, you know, cause the kids are, you know, they'll do it. Mom and dad drag them on a Saturday to take their hour of English classes. They'll suffer through with you. But I, I started to experiment and I started using games like playing Monopoly and stuff as a way because when you teach out of a book, the kids are just memorizing stuff and spitting it out. And, you know, and then like, you know, they weren't really like getting conversational and I was noticing all these problems. So I started doing things where we actually used the language and the kids loved it. And then the parents loved it because their kids were psyched to come to English classes. And then the owners loved it because they were making more money, right? The owners of the, the language. So I started to get into it like that. And then I went to graduate school at George Mason. And this was right after a year of teaching in the ghetto in Dallas. I mean, a really difficult situation. I mean, a middle school and, you know, some of the parents were already in jail for murder and wow. whatever other crazy, you know, low income American city situation. And then when I went to graduate school, I started to get turned on to constructivism, which, you know, it's, it's a fundamental, you know, you could call it a pedagogy of progressive education where you're not really supposed to try and shape the kids and you're supposed to let them form their own kind of understanding of things and then take these knowledge, skill and understandings and apply them in a real world situation rather than taking a memory based test. And, and that was interesting, but I had this professor First class I took, her name was Dr. Beverly Shackley, very influential woman, and she's opposite to me when I think ideologically. I mean, she's a total SJW. We even talked about social justice in our classes, like pew, pew, but whatever. Um, <laughs> she, I highly respect and love this woman because she really changed my thinking. And my first assignment was write a year-long classroom management plan that does not use rewards and punishments. And I was kind of like, ooh, wow. and that was difficult. It was difficult for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when I started thinking like, wait a minute. And I started to think back of things I had done in the classroom where I stopped punishing kids and I would go out in the hallway, like with these teenagers in Dallas, especially, I mean, kids like, you know, who were like gangbanging on the weekends and selling crack or whatever they did. I mean, like 
you know, kids getting caught with guns and, and knives and things. And I would, I would go out in the hallway and have these you know, conversations and I started working, which I, would, I understand right now it was a relational, uh, more of a restorative way. I didn't even know what that was at the time. And all of a sudden my classes changed dramatically and the kids all of a sudden like worked with me and they weren't combative and, and I'm, I'm reflecting. And then, so, you know, I don't want to go on too long on this, but I moved to Taiwan in the middle of doing my graduate degree and I was teaching in the classrooms there, and this is what really started to get me questioning things, was at the end of these unit studies, you have a, a, an end of unit summative assessment, and they weren't test-based. You could do all kinds of things, but what I would do is I would write a rubric so the kids kind of had some guidelines of you know, what would make this acceptable, but I let them express their learning in any way they wanted. When I did this, the rooms would explode with activity and the kids would just go absolutely nuts. The parents couldn't drag them home at the end of the day. And so I was like, well, that's interesting. What's going on here? And then the next year I had moved up to Thailand to take a different job. And in graduate school, a professor suggested, uh, I read a book by Dan Pink, which I did. And it was, uh, it was related to education, but it, it was more of a business oriented book. And then, so one day I was reading his book and I was like, I wonder if he's got a Ted talk. And I popped it on and sure enough, he's got this Ted talk called the surprising science of motivation. And I watched it. And basically the underlying point is autonomy motivates. And I was like, well, that explains a lot mm -hmm. of what I was seeing in Taiwan. And then I was uh, getting into Ken Robinson at the time, you know, this was probably 2008, nine, 10. And he had put out that book, the element passion and talent. It, that's where it's at. And so how I got into this is I was working at a, an international school, but I got a, an opportunity to run a salmon fly factory in Thailand, which was one of the best experiences in my life. And when I was there, I started paying for my daughter because I wasn't teaching. I get free tuition as a benefit. And so I sent my daughter to this brand new little cool international school that was like environmental and Buddhist and, you know, permaculture. And it looked really cool. And after like two months, I was just seeing what garbage, you know, I was paying for. And I'm like, you know, I'm not paying for this crap. I have a master's <laughs> degree. I can do better myself. So I had been following the libertarian homeschooler on Facebook and some other people. Yeah, like I'd never considered homeschooling. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to just homeschool my daughter and I'm not paying all this money for this garbage. And so I pulled my daughter out and I started talking to friends of mine and they were like, hey, we can save a lot of money. How about we give you some money and you educate our kids? So I just ended up forming a co-op. And it's wow. interesting because I saw at least once you interviewed Dana Martin because yeah. I had never heard of unschooling or self-directed learning. And one day I came home and I'd hired an English teacher and like six or so of my friends, we were all chipping in like three, 400 bucks a month to help pay for the teacher. And we rented a huge house and, you know, to help kind of suck up the bills. It was not a profit oriented venture. And so we're doing this thing. And I came home one day and the guy that I had hired to teach was hanging out with the kids. And he goes, because I, I, what I was doing was I was like, hey, use the ideas from Dan Pink and Ken Robinson and let the kids do what they want. And if they need your help, help them. And if not, leave them alone. Make sure they don't get hurt. Feed them some sandwiches, blah, blah, blah. You know, and mm -hmm. I came home one day and he's like, hey, check this video out I found. And he put it on and it was an interview of Dana Martin on some talk show. And she started talking about unschooling. And I'm like, oh. We don't have to invent this thing. It already exists. We're on <laughs> school. That's funny. So that, I mean, that's how it all started. That's awesome. It's funny yeah. how, you know, it's like a thread, you know, it leads you to different things like that. So it's yeah. funny too that you mentioned Dan Pink because it seems like his name is coming up a lot in the interviews that I do with different people. Yeah. You said, you know, as you were putting in your form to do a podcast with me, you mentioned several different things that I could ask you about. So this next question may not make a lot of sense, but what did you find when, uh, with the discovery of self-directed learning and how that might either work or conflict with parenting? You know, some oh. people say that parenting and education or education is just a form of parenting. So that's an interesting question, and I really think education is a form of parenting, because before we had this thing called school, or even some of the, mm -hmm. the things we had before schools, like guilds and, and what have you for people to learn, you know, that's basically how it was. It was parents and then, you know, other adults, you know, role models in the community or whatever, um, and that's kind of how, like, I, I think nature intended it. And so school is an unnatural thing. It's, and, you know, almost all of the schools out there, not 100%, are coercive and arguably uh, not even a mild form of child abuse. It can even be like extreme child abuse. And 
I think humanity is, is really needs to wake up from that and bring it back to the parents, which we can get into later. Cause I mean, I yeah. have my ideas about how to try and jumpstart this thing in which this COVID thing has helped a bit, but we really need to jumpstart this. I think it's critical, but I won't get so deep into that, but yes, parenting is a, a form of education. I mean, that's essentially, I mean, we're trying to grow these kids up so they can be free and independent at some point from us. And so, you know, that's education. Yeah. Well, and let's kind of talk about that. How do you suggest that we parent that might be different than the norm? Um, I feel like a lot of our parenting so far has had to align with the public school system. And so, you know, parents become this real authoritarian type person, which when I do coaching, I talk about that a lot. Like sometimes we feel like, you know, when we bring our kids home, we become more authoritarian than we already were just because we've seen that done to us in public school, how can we parent that might be different than what we see out there? That's excellent. And I try to uh, address this in the book. And when I wrote the book, it was quite a while ago, and I, I need to write a, another book. I've got some stuff in the works because I, maybe I could tone down my language, but I was referring to <laughs> uh, not being a mini dictator for your child and things like that, because you're right. We have been conditioned by the public school system, and you can see parents, the vast majority of people I'm, I'm around, parents model that authoritarian behavior because it's so ingrained from their schooling experience and maybe how their parents treated them, and it's just completely unnecessary. And so, I mean, that's part of the battle. That's part of what my book is about, is really trying to give parents the information they need. Because there was things I went through to break out of what I will say my conditioning or my indoctrination or my brainwashing. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them was learning about the history of school. And I went deep through John Taylor Gatto at first, and now I've branched out to some other, other uh, scholars out there. And that really shocked me. And it wasn't, I wasn't surprised when I learned. I was like, well, that sure explains a lot, you know. They didn't implement schools to create a loving, enlightened culture. They wanted to either have like Puritans or good factory slaves. And uh, that was kind of the objective. And I was kind of like, that makes a lot of sense. And so that was a big thing for me to help me break out of my social conditioning. And then being an educator, like I said, it was educational research that led me to the doorstep of self-directed learning is because I was learning things that were current in education that pointed in me in that direction. And so I was trying to invent it before I even knew it existed. So the middle of my book is really focused on looking at, at uh, you know, my experience as an educator and my knowledge with educational research and tying that to the self-directed learning philosophy and method. And then the end of the book, I have a, what I call the personal learner profile, and, and it gives the parents a chance to really go inside themselves and experience and think about who they are as a learner and reflect back on their life you know, looking at things like Myers-Briggs or multiple intelligences or authoritarian disposition, you know, like this anti-authoritarian, they even have these crazy so-called disorders like oppositional defiant disorder. I'm like, that's probably the thing you want to be labeled with, man. It's like, <laughs> I'm a critical, free-thinking person, and I'm sorry you teachers can't handle that, but I don't have a problem. You do, and wake up, and don't be a brainwashed drone, and treat people, especially children, mean, thinking you're doing good in this world. So I'm not sure. I, I don't want to go too far on a tangent here, but that's kind of my general thinking on that, that line. Well, and that flows out through the rest of the community. I remember being at the gym with my son and some lady there treated him just really rude. I mean, we were working together and using a couple different machines, but I was over on the other one and came back. And he's like, wow, that lady just let me have it for like hogging this machine, even though we were using it, you know, he would go to one and then I'd go to another. And, but right. I was like, she would never do that to me. You know, she would have never said that to me, but she felt like because he was young and a child, I mean, it was like probably 15, 16 years old, somewhere in there. Right. He was obviously legal age to be in there, though. I would have taken him in there <laughs> without right. you know, that being the case. But, you know, it's just interesting how we feel entitled as adults to tell children off that aren't our own or we don't have anything to do with them or anything because of the way we've been schooled that hierarchy of education, you know, like I'm older than you and I'm tougher than you. So I should tell you <laughs> in a yeah. not so very way. It just permeates throughout our whole society, which is really sad. So do you feel like there were any other challenges that you had as a, you know, a professional educator 
you know, moving through like working in like the schooling environment? Yeah, the biggest, I mean, a, a problem, I guess you could call it a problem is when I initially, like back when I was, you know, like discovered Dana Martin, what, what unschooling mm -hmm. was and really got into it. I like, I felt like, how do I explain it? It was like, I, I learned this great stuff that I wanted to share. So I started to try and talk to people about it, you know, like friends and family and boy, I was rejected and boy, it hurt. And that's part of what was really difficult because I wasn't getting support and I was basically being called a lunatic and that I was going to destroy my child or that I was going to harm. Right. And I mean, it's difficult to hear your family and friends like just rejecting you. And I'm like, but none of you are educators, you know, like I have a master's degree in like 15 years experience. Like, can't you even open your mind a little bit to maybe I'm not crazy? Oh no, you're put your daughter in school. Oh, blah, blah. Okay. Okay. Whatever. Um, that was very difficult for me. And it took me you a few mean, years. You mean when you pulled your child out, they were being critical. Is that what you were meaning? Like, oh, or just, okay. When I pulled my child out, but even when I tried to, you know, Talk. advocate this okay. kind of new thing or share, like I would share information. I'm like, it's absolutely crazy. Like how people are so close minded. You know, I've done all this research. I'm thoroughly on the cutting edge of educational research and people just talk to me like I'm an idiot. People who have no know nothing about what they're talking about. And it's just an assumption it's a, it, that they have. It's like almost like a re religious dogma that mm -hmm. you run up against. And so I was like, okay, that was really making me upset. And, and, and the conversations that I had weren't helping the self-directed learning cause and they weren't helping my emotional uh, state of being. So I, I backed off of trying to talk to people and, and I, I wasn't even trying to convince people. I was just trying to get people to entertain a different way of thinking and eh, not happening. But probably the hardest thing was when I finished working at the fly factory, the salmon fly factory, I went back into working as an educator. Cause I mean, you know, at my age with a master's degree and a career, it's really my best way to make money. And I, I'm actually really good. I, I love teaching. I love working with kids and teenagers and parents, but being in the school, it became very apparent to me, like what we were doing was questionable on moral grounds that we were really abusing children. And I mean, it, it kind of hurt my soul, but I didn't really have another choice. You know, like, what am I going to do? Go wait tables or sell cigarettes at 7-Eleven? Like, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of trapped in this career if I want to provide for my family, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, most of the schools I worked at were absolute torture after that. I mean, and I kid you not, absolute torture. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the educational field, and I don't want to start slagging off teachers because I love them. They're great people. And a, a guy I know is a professor, and he said something once, don't hate the players, hate the game. And so that really works for me, you know, because a lot of teachers out there don't even understand what they're doing. They're just mind controlled. And then there's people like me who have broken out of the mind control and, you know, we're in there trying to do good work, but they're not bad people. They just, it's like, forgive them father for they know not what they do kind of a situation. Well, yeah, it's so a generational thing. You know, it's yeah. something that's kind of been passed down throughout the generations. We think it's normal, uh, you know, to do that. Yep. So, absolutely. Um, so those were like, that was, you know, probably my biggest challenge. And it's not like the school I work at now has been a, a blessing. I haven't worked at a school in, you know, almost ever. I've worked at a few schools that were cool, but not great. But this school I work at now is, is um, they're really cutting edge on progressive education. They're entertaining. You know, we use the term self-directed. Now I brought that into the school I and mean, they can't go full self-directed and still like have customers <laughs> because people <laughs> would freak out, especially the Cambodian culture is just definitely not ready for that yet. Neither is Americans for that matter. Yeah. Right. And, but I can get in there and I, I ended the punitive system at the school and turned it into restorative. So we don't punish kids anymore and we discourage rewards and punishments and behaviorism. So I'm very happy about what I've been able to do there. And here's my first day. I finished my contract yesterday yesterday. So this is my first day of freedom till I start my new job. But anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Like when it comes to challenges that, yeah. you know, after <laughs> discovering self-directed learning. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, every day that you have to do it becomes almost painful because you know that there's a better way of doing that. Yeah. So, well, I'm going to switch back to parenting. Hopefully we can kind of tie all this together because I really do, especially in our climate in America, of what's going on right now, um, I want people to understand like how parenting might fit with that self-governance. And mm -hmm. then I want to move in and talk about like 
some economic freedoms. And these were topics that you mentioned that I could ask you about, but I really think it's important to clarify, uh, you know, with Dana Martin, we talked a little bit about capitalist anarchy and volunteerism. And if people don't know by now that I'm somewhat fit in with that libertarian camp, but I want to know how like parenting can kind of fit in with that self-governance. It's actually, you know, when I think about like my friend Patrick, who's got um, Peaceful Parenting University, asked me to develop a course, how to do self-directed learning or how to do unschooling. And it's a really hard thing because it's like asking like, how do you grow a tomato plant or something? And it's not like there's one set way and depending yeah. on where you live and what kind of soil you have and blah, 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 never ending things like what you have to do to make it work right. And it's like that with self-directed learning, but there are some fundamentals um, that are helpful. And one of them is trusting your child. And so I think if you can learn to trust your child, and of course, maturity becomes a factor. Like you can't trust a two-year-old not to run out in the road in front of a truck, right? You got to hold their hand or grab them by the shirt or whatever. But as the child grows up, if you trust your child to make decisions for themselves about what they want to learn and how and who they want to learn it with and all those kinds of things, that's a very helpful step to get away from the kind of control freakish parent mode. Also, I really believe that like reading some basic information about how people learn and what motivates people can also be helpful as a threshold because it gives parents a little bit of a sense of security because it's fear that I really think holds parents back when they like right now, if you say you're going through COVID and you know, your kid's out of school and and it's really, it's annoying. And it's, I've seen it mostly from the left people is like that. Oh, I can't believe I have to educate my own kid. And they're almost like offended that like they have to actually deal with their kid. And I'm just like, how sad, Yeah. you know, it's just breaks my heart. I'm like, Oh, we can't wait to get them back into school and stuff. And I'm just like, man, you are gross. Stop saying that. This is the child that uses your kid. Right. And, but there's a lot of parents right now. And uh, Corey DeAngelis is putting out some really good survey data of parents who are now questioning school because they do have their kids at home and all of a sudden their kids are happier and and more motivated to learn and their whole family lifestyle is kind of much more groovy and um so it looks like there's gonna be uh you know an increase in (laughs) in numbers Yeah. yeah and so you know with this coming transition for parents to be able to learn how to not be authoritarian to become homeschoolers is kind of like doing it school at home. And that's going to kind of lead you more towards the authoritarian approach. Like, okay, Billy, sit down. It's math time. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's reading time. Right. And that's just going to end up being annoying like school. So the self-directed and unschooling. And the reason why I say both, I used to say they were synonymous and I actually think they are, but recently I've read some information and I could see how people could make the argument that unschooling is kind of like pure, and you've never been tainted with the evils of school or whatever. And self-directed is kind of give your kid the freedom. And if they choose that they want to go to school and you let them, that you're still doing self-directed learning. And so I guess I could use the terms differently in that way. But anyway, I'll just leave it at that. (laughs) I'm kind of getting in a rabbit hole here. Well, and I love the three points that you, I put three because I put down like your child (laughs) as number three, (laughs) because I think that's part of it. But that autonomy fits so well with self-governance. And I really think like if you look at these points that you put of like trust your child and look at those decisions, do some reading and educate yourself, you know, what helps spark motivation and that autonomy and then like your child, we see that reflected back in our societies. And that's where I think like we're seeing this real sharp like lockdown basically of like all of the citizens feel like all of a sudden we can't trust one another. We're not reading what helps to motivate people. I mean, uh, we saw with the COVID thing, depression spike like 600%, which we already had a problem with anyway. You know, it just did this huge spike because we lost all autonomy. None of us feel motivated to do anything thing because we're being told, we're even told which directions in the grocery store to go and, you know, all that kind of thing. And then we don't even like one another. I mean, we're calling each other names on social media. We're, you know, doing all that. And I feel like it, the way that we educate it parrots or it mirrors what's happening in our society now. And we're like, what in the, you know, all hell is breaking loose type of thing. But yep. Let's talk a little bit before we get back into your book and all that stuff. Like, 
let's talk about that freedom that we might see, you know, school us a little bit about anarchism, because a lot of people think like these riots that we're seeing, that's anarchy, you know, and that's what that society would look like if you just left it unchecked. And then how volunteerism and libertarianism fits in with that self-directed learning and that parenting. Yeah, it's funny because there really, the more I get into this, that there really is, a, and this is part of uh, the how to unschool your kid kind of stuff, is there's a uniqueness to what I would call like family culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and whether you're a religious person or you're uh, just a hardcore statist, a Democrat or Republican or whatever, you know, these things matter and, and it's okay. Like I reject statism, but I realize most people don't. And, you know, uh, I'm fascinated by all religions, but, you know, we don't really practice one in particular, but I would consider us, you know, motivated by the ideals and fundamentals of, of religion in general. These kinds of big things matter. And so, you know, when you're raising, you know, a child, if you are an anarchist, and I call myself an anarchist, and it's funny you mentioned because when the COVID thing, when the riots started breaking out and they started using the term anarchy, I'm just like false advertising, absolutely wrong. Yeah. Um, but people, almost everybody sees anarchy as a reaction against authoritarian governments because that's usually how people see it pan out. And they think, oh, yeah, people get mad and then there's anarchy and they break windows and burn cars. And I'm like, no. You know, that has nothing to do with anarchy. Anarchy just means without rulers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I think of well, anarchy and, and well, go ahead, go ahead. Well, and the crazy thing is, is we saw businesses getting looted and rioting going on, you know, all of this stuff happening. And we had police officers like right there. The government was told to stand down. I mean, even the police officers were told to stand down. So really all of that happened with the permission and the acceptance from a leader. Do you know what I mean? Like it was completely, and then you as a person, you didn't even, because we had police just standing like right there, you as a person didn't even necessarily have a right to defend your own business. Do you know what I mean? Like yep. you were expecting this leader to come in and help you and they didn't do the one job that we think that we need them for, right? Is to help create a peaceful and orderly society. Yep. So anyway, go ahead with your thought. <laughs> Yeah, you're spot on. You know, when I was watching all of that chaos, it just so bothers me because it looks like 98% engineered anger between groups that really don't have a lot to be angry at each other. But going back to like the anarchy thing is, is I started chatting with some friends. I'm like, man, you know, like we got to get out in front of this because I've been calling myself an anarchist for a long time, you know, which I'm a volunteerist. I'm an anarchist. I don't vote. I don't participate in democracy. But if I did, I would be a libertarian, you know, but it's mostly semantics when you look at what's the difference between anarchy and volunteerism. But I was thinking, you know, maybe I should switch to the term volunteerist because it's less shocking for people and they don't have that negative connotation baggage in their head. But I decided to stick with anarchists so people can freak out on me and then I can explain myself because I think the thing that we could use to heal all of this division in society, because the non-aggression principle to me is the fundamental thing that people need to grasp to raise our species and our societies from an uncivilized way of existence to, I would think, stage one of actually being civilized. And the mm -hmm. non-aggression, which I'm sure you very well know, is just basically not using force and coercion or violence um, against other people unless it's defending against the person being violent or aggressive or whatever towards you or other potential victims. And to me, that is like the fundamental rule of engagement if we want to have a peaceful, prosperous world. And so they're throwing around the term anarchy, and, and I'm sure it's being done on purpose because we know the people who own the mainstream media. The <laughs> last thing they want is people to get like the ideas of freedom and that you don't need you know overlords in their heads because that kind of threatens their uh, power base. But really, like, you know, tying it back into like parenting and, and mm -hmm. stuff is that if we raise our kids with these fundamentals of being non-aggressive towards other people, 
trusting them and having conversations and allowing them as long as they're not going to endanger themselves or something bad could happen, just pretty much allowing them to follow their own life's path lets them grow up in an anarchy state where they don't have a ruler. They have mm -hmm. a mom and a dad who love them and want to help them become the best version of themselves. And I think when kids are raised, and this is going to take generations, that we will actually see a shift in society. It's going to have to start with like the grassroots and it's going to have to be future generations because I don't think we're going to convert most people who are, you know, let's just say 30s and above. They're just way too deeply ingrained and either, you know, a left winger or a right winger and they're trapped in that paradigm and they can't think of outside of it. And people like you and me sound like crazy people to yeah. them and they get <laughs> mad at us. For simple philosophical conversations, people get mad and it's just, it's insane. It really is. <laughs> yeah. I start screaming on the internet, like, stop being violent. <laughs> you know, it's just oh, not, really? it's not working. Anyway, that was perfect. I think that now our audience can see how, you know, we've gone from talking about government and all of that stuff to parenting back to, you know, self-directed and learning and education, but it really does all fit together. And I love the non-aggression principle because when we think about it, you know, I came to uh, principles of economic freedom first and it mm -hmm. trickled into my home life because I was like, it's kind of like um, Akilah Richards, you know, like if we want to raise liberated people, if we want to have a liberated society, we have to raise free people. And I yep. started to realize like how I was being very authoritarian in my approach and it was affecting the possibility that my children would want to live in a free society and live in a place where we trust one another and that we work to help give autonomy and motivation to those people around us. So I think that was yep. a perfect segue. Um, so let's kind of talk about like as parents, what we can do to basically liberate our children and, you know, and hopefully move them towards this direction of a world where we have that non-aggression principle is permeating throughout everything that we do. You know, I kind of told you my paradigm change about how I filtered all of that into education and, and government and all that. But tell me about yours. Like, what did that look like um, throughout time? We've done little yeah. bits and pieces of it, you know, with books that you've read and stuff. But yeah. let's talk about from where it was to where you feel like it is now. Oh, that's it's really great. It's, uh, I mean, how this all started for me. I mean, it, it all kind of happened at a similar time when I was discovering self-directed learning and education, but also, like you said, it started for me, too, with economics um, and economic freedom. And God, it was probably around 2000. In 2005, I met my biological family, and they're all from Oklahoma. And I have a brother who is like me, but he's, I'm kind of more the high-strung version, and he's more the super chill version. But we think so similarly. I, I mean, it's mm -hmm. unbelievable. And, you know, maybe I, I was living in uh, Texas. I think it was 2007, 8. And when I was working at that school, I had mentioned earlier and, you know, the election was coming up and, you know, like we're having conversations. I think it was Al Gore who was running and, and, uh, but there was this guy in the race. I think he was running at that time as a Republican. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Ron Paul. I'm sure, you know, Ron Paul maybe yeah. even helped you get into economic freedom. <laughs> and my yeah. brother was like, you know, Hey, I really interested by this guy, Ron Paul. And I'm like, you know, Who's he? He's like, oh, it's this Republican from Texas. You know, and me growing up in New England, you know, we think everybody from Texas is like, you know, some kind of right wing Christian gun toting person, you know, and so I'm just like, wow. So I, he showed me a video and, and here's Ron Paul advocating like legalizing drugs and prostitution and all this. And I'm like, what the hell? You know? <laughs> A Christian from Texas advocating drug legal, and he wasn't advocating doing it. He was very clear. I don't advocate. I think this is wrong. It's immoral. It's unhealthy, right? But people should have the freedom and stuff. And I was like, okay, you've got my intention, my man. So I, <laughs> I started getting his books and I read End the Fed. And that was like, oh, wow, I fully get it. And then I understood the economic paradigm and how we've all been enslaved. I don't want to go too deep. You know all this too. And that really was big. And then I just happened to be going to graduate school at George Mason University just outside DC in 2008 in the summertime. And there was a big Liberty March there. And Ron Paul was the, uh, you know, what would you call him? The, the headliner of the, the gig. And there was all kinds of great speakers that day, you know, um, Oh gosh, I'm spacing his name. The creature from Jekyll Island, gentleman, and okay. all kinds of people in the liberty movement were there. And 
you know, I just went and I heard all these speeches and, and my mind really started to open up, but I wasn't really into anarchy or, or volunteerism. I was just all of a sudden like, wow, it's liberty that we need. It's like, oh, wait, right. This is America. We have the Liberty Bell and all this <laughs> stuff. But I, oh, wait. Oh, crap. They're into these inalienable rights. Oh, wait. And I started to get the whole thing just dropped in a matter of a year. And, and I escaped. I broke out. And I, you know, I, was, I went to Goddard College and Bernie Saunders' wife was president when I was there. And he's a graduate. And everybody there was a hardcore social justice warrior. And so I was kind of steeped and indoctrinated kind of in that way of thinking, not even knowing. But Ron Paul broke me out of it, and that's how it started for me. And, and I don't even remember where I got onto anarchy and volunteerism, but it was all at that same time. Once I discovered Dr. Paul, and you know, I loved it in 2012 when he was just running during the primaries, and he, you know, you'd hear the thousands of people chanting "and the Fed," you know, and I'm like, this is great. Oh, this guy's gonna really change America. And then like, you're like, oh wow. That was a big nothing in the end. Like they just totally shut him up and, you know, kind of kept yeah. him out of the mainstream media. But he sparked the Liberty Fire. And you can see it's burning healthy in America. It's just not getting airtime right now. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But that's how okay. it happened for me. Yeah. Well, and I remember probably one of the most shocking things to me, and my brother was really into Ron Paul. And I'm, the first time he ran, I'm like, this guy's a quack. What he said was so shocking to me that it really made me like double check myself. And I remember it was just at the Republican primary. So, you know, you think they're all, like you said, gun toting Christians type of thing that's there. And I remember him being asked, like, what do you think about how we should do foreign policy? And he's like, well, I think we should do it like, I can't even remember. I don't think he said like Jesus did, but, but in the, well, maybe he did. Maybe he actually used that like of, you know, we just um, treat people the way that we would want to be treated. And I yep. remember him getting booed. And I was like, I think that just shocked me because that was the first time I'm like, oh yeah, as a Christian, I should want that, right? I should want, you know, I should want us to treat people like we would want to be treated. And I just remember like him being booed and me feeling like really like, wow, I don't, obviously not the same kind of Christian these people are because yep. and I don't believe that, you know? And I think that really opened my eyes to go, okay, maybe I should check out the rest of what this person says. Okay, I don't want to go into any more of that, but to see how it kind of fits together. So let's go back. Obviously, I'm going to restate your book so that we can kind of, you know, remember what we were talking about. But Unschooling Yourself First, A Parent's Guide to That Self-Directed Learning. What are some constructive ways for a parent to kind of move into being able to educate our children better? you know, what are some steps we need to do in order to help them move in the self-directed autonomy full kind of education? Yep. It's a challenge and it really depends. I mean, it's so dependent. Every family is going to have their unique situation, where you live, what kind of careers mom and or dad has, mm -hmm. uh, how old your kids are. So there's a lot of, and just the way society's constructed probably the biggest hurdle at the beginning is if mom and dad which is you know the case for most people have to go to work <laughs> so what do you do with your kids you know yeah. unless they're old enough to stay home by themselves that's probably the first other than getting over your fear is the, probably the first big hurdle but that presents a real challenge and then you know the getting over the fear that you're going to mess your kid up or they won't be educated and and you know basically it's just fear from ignorance but those are, are probably some of the biggest challenges at the beginning. But I've even gone through this myself, like trying to, you know, every time I, I go to get a new job or whatever, it's so challenging to make things work for my family that will enable us a situation where we can let my daughter do self-directed learning, you know, and, and there was yeah. even points in my life where like, gosh, we're going to both have to be working and, my, you know, you know, my wife and I both out of the house, what's Jade going to do? And like, you know, if we're living here, she'll get stuck with maybe government school. And I'm like, please, you know, I, you know, and like even facing this myself, like my gosh. And so that's a real challenge. But I, I, there's a lot there. If you're creative and you're dedicated and you just say, OK, we're going to do this. There's some ways that you can make things happen. And I think the, the one that people don't realize first, which I think is, is probably the best way to kind of try and make it happen, is start talking to people in your community. Reach out, get together and have coffees or even beers. 
and find other parents who are struggling, you know? And it's kind of strange. It, it might be a lot of these people who have kids who are anti-authoritarian or they just aren't wired to learn in a school. Not that anyone is, but they're really wired not to learn in that environment. And it's ruining their kids' lives. These are the first people who will come and sit down and listen mm -hmm. to, to, hey, this is an option. And so when you get these people who are, are frustrated with school or who maybe heard some friends who are into it and, hey, hey, that sounds cool. It doesn't always have to be like, oh, kids, my kid's life is being ruined in school or all of a sudden want to entertain this idea. And so if you can reach out in your community and find some people who are willing to meet and talk, the chances are there's somebody in this pool of people who maybe not have a job. Or there's someone in there who has a job that doesn't make tons of money and maybe everybody could throw in 100 or 200 or 300 bucks a month to fork over some cash to an individual so they can be around a home to watch over kids who aren't old enough to take care of themselves, right? But you're going to have to network if you're in, in the situation where you're, you just don't have the freedom to do an unschooling or a homeschooling thing is that you're really trapped and your kid has to be taken care of during the day. Those are, I think, that's probably the best way. I mean, if you've got some money, you know, and you live in proximity to a self-directed learning school, you could call it, or program or center like North Star or even Sudbury, although I'm not the hugest mm -hmm. fan of Sudbury. I, I, I mean, I love and respect what they do, but they're, they're kind of funny about, they're more into the indoctrination than I can take myself. They're, they're indoctrinating kids. End of story to, to be a democratic whatever it is. Um, and so I don't really think it's even unschooling, and they admit that too. But I do think I would be happy if my daughter went to a Sudbury school, and I, I love and respect them for what they do, but it's just not my flavor of, of unschooling. But anyway, getting back, if you live near one of these places, and they're all over the U.S., there's Agile Learning, there's Action Sudbury. Academies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, so. there's a lot out there. So you can, if you're lucky and you have the money, you can tap into these places, and that's probably, you know, if you don't have a ability to do it at home, and maybe even if you do, it might be the ideal. And why do I say that? It's because when your kids are growing up, it's nice to be away from mom and dad. It's nice to be away from adults with other kids. So if you have a place that has like a safe environment with adults around who are there if they're needed, but they're not there if they're not needed, and the kids can run wild and do whatever they want and play in the woods and go fishing, or if you're in a city, do city stuff, I, I really think that's the optimum. It's, it's having a rat pack of kids together is so rich. So much learning happens when you, when you have that. So to kind of make a long story short, whoever, if you really want to get into this and you're not there yet, you're going to have to network. You're going to have to reach out. You're going to have to build a tribe. And that will enable you to make things happen. That's awesome. Because really, that is the, the hardest part for many people is like, oh, I'd love to do this, but how do I actually live life or, you know, and, and yeah. provide for us and then not make that work? And, and I know uh, probably one of the ways that we connected, it was Blake Bowles' book. I love the idea where yeah. he talks about like, talk about your child's mental health. Is this really a good place for them to be? And maybe they do need something different than that. And I think um, we forget like in the 1970s, we did a lot of this unschooling type of stuff, 1970s, 80s type of thing, at least I did, where we had a lot of mothers home, but nobody was really watching over us. Nobody was really moving our uh, activities along, you know, like adults like yeah. to do now. We were free to form our own teams and play our own games and um you know all within multi-age groups like you're talking about where we were all together and learning from one another and there was a lot of protection there and a lot of help and all of that kind of thing definitely what do you feel like are three key points that people can get out of your book how to unschool yourself you know we started with that reaching out and trying to build that community and that network but yeah, it's going back to the unschooling yourself first. Really, it's this book was written for people who are complete newbies, and I'm really trying to convince them or get them. It, it, I almost want to call it boot camp for the mind. It's, it's really focused at trying to cut through social conditioning mm -hmm. um, and this, you know, this, this creepy mind control that is so permeated in, in America. I, I don't want to start sounding insulting, but North America and, and Korea, North Korea, remind me a lot of each other because they're just so deeply indoctrinated. You know, you see people crying like when Obama got elected or when Trump won or something. And you're just like, are you serious? 
Yeah, You're crying. Like a religion. <laughs> Our political it. parties are religions. <laughs> yeah. They get hysterical. And it reminds me of like when Kim Jong-il died, you know, and you see people weeping and, you know, they weren't pulling out their hair, but almost that kind of fanatical, like childish, just sad mentality. So that's why like, I wrote the book really trying to help break through that. And the, the, like I said before, the history of, of school for me was important. Understanding educational research and especially the stuff that points you towards self-directed learning was huge. And then probably the biggest thing was to, and, and this is how like I do a lot of work with parents, you know, who are considering, uh, who are usually their parents who have a kid who's, uh, you know, either a, a hyperactive boy or, you know, a teenage girl. These are kind of the main uh, candidates that come out and, and need some help from me. And, you know, when I'm talking to people and trying to get them to open up, I ask questions like, you know, when they start saying, yeah, but how will my kid learn? And da, 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 I say, just sit there for a minute and tell me some things that you learned in high school that you can remember. And, you know, people will scratch their heads and they'll kind of like, you know, pop out a couple of like tidbits of stuff, but they really can't remember much of what they mm -hmm. learned. You know, and I'm like, so how much algebra have you used in the last year, you know? And yeah. people just look at you so kind of funny. And I'm like, right. So if you don't remember much of what you learned in high school and it has no or little meaning in your life now, like, what are we doing? And that helps people. And then I really think that going inside yourself and reflecting on what are my passions, right? What do I love to do and why do I do it? And people all of a sudden will be like, my gosh, I love working in the garden and no one pays me. And when I come home from work, I just can't wait to go out, start digging around in the flowers, you know? And, and then they start thinking about like how they got into a career or whatever job and, and, and it's stale and meaningless in their lives. And so by going inside and learning about your own strengths and weaknesses, you know, because we all have them. And once they get into this process of, of self inner exploration, I think that it helps them detach from control freakish parenting because even though they're your children and they are genetically coded from you and your partner, they are different than you in, in a lot of ways. And they have different desires and different uh, needs in life and they're going to have different challenges. And once parents can see that, I think it helps them become a trusting, peaceful, loving parent who's going to become more of a guide and a cheerleader mm -hmm. than the control freakish dictator parent who thinks they have to like run their kid through a bunch of hoops all day to make them come out to be like, you know, Harvard quality, you know, academic minded scientist or whatever fantasy they have going on. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, what I would say the nutshell of what the goals of this book is to try and give parents one, a way to break out of the social conditioning and two, some ways to help them understand that they're different than their child and they don't need to control their child. They need to enable their child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just interviewed um, the authors for the self-directed child and they talked yep. about um, becoming a consultant parent. And that's kind of the same thing like you're talking about, like where we become a mentor or we become, we remove ourselves as, um, you know, the authoritarian, the parent who knows all the answers and we become like working alongside our kids where we're moving through our life and they're moving through theirs. And of course, as a parent, we're going to give them um, more advice because we have more life experience. But at the same time, like we are raising children at a different time than we do. So our, I, my, I know my kids understand, you know, computers and all that stuff a lot better than even I do. Mm -hmm. And so we can work together an awful lot. I love the idea of social conditioning. We talk a lot about that de-schooling process. And I really feel like it's harder for parents to de-school themselves. I remember uh, homeschooling my kids a lot. I felt guilty all the time of like, okay, this isn't looking like I remember my education looking and feeling like I was making mistakes somewhere and that kind of thing. And I felt like I was always apologizing to my children and my kids were like, I'm having a great time. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, but I was so like wrapped up in my own experience, worried that, you know, because I wasn't doing it like I saw like I did that somehow I was doing it wrong I love how your book might address that you know like you're not doing it wrong you know you're kind of trying to break out of that mold of the way we have been doing it so 
That's great. So in your bio, we mentioned that you're writing a parent course. You know, if somebody were to take that course, what would they find there? That's a good question. I can only answer somewhat superficially because I haven't, I mean, I just finished my contract yesterday from work and, and uh, you know, I'm okay. very, and- uh, I mean, like my, the middle school, I mean, it's, it's a K through 12 school and we've got 2000 students. The middle school's got almost 700. So I have a lot of responsibility, but what I've been doing is reflecting and when I'm on the weekends and I'm just chilling, I've been rereading some of my, the most influential people, rereading their books and taking notes and, and quotes and things to try and formulate my ideas. But some of the fundamentals that I'm going to work on, we talked about already, like building a tribe, trusting your child. A very useful thing is autonomy and personal or individual responsibility. I think that's a very helpful tool for parents to grab onto because you know, you want to let your kid do whatever they want, but until they have the maturity to be completely independent, you can't do that because they could hurt or kill themselves or, (laughs) you know, bad things can happen. So, you know, you have to be able to measure like, okay, you know, uh, you know, my daughter's uh, seven now and, you know, she doesn't run across the street and I don't have to hold her hand, you know, and she can do these things, but I can't leave her at home alone. Right. You know, at seven, she's just not there yet. And so being able to give as much autonomy as possible with it still being, you know, safe and constructive until the point where you can give 100%. My daughter's 15 now and, you know, we're moving back to America and she's all in the planning process of, you know, she's looking at North Star because we're not going to be too far from North Star. She's looking at Keene State College or University. She's maybe thinking she'd start college this fall rather than wasting her time trying to do some kind of high school thing. Mm -hmm. She's looking at, at doing... Um, you know, just staying at home and, and picking off online courses. But for her, it's, it's really interesting. Like what I'm going through right now, I think is a really good example of, of how, you know, self-directed learning can work is my daughter's in school right now because she wanted to be, and she spent most of her life out, but she chose to go to school and she loves it, which is great. I'm so happy for her. Right. And the irony, you know, of being an unschooler, schooling dad and your daughter wants to go to school and you let her, oh my gosh, wow, she's directing her own learning. Some people are very critical, like, oh, you let your daughter go to school, she's going to be ruined. And I'm like, oh, calm down. So anyway, what the process that we're going through right now is like, she wants to get not just a dog, but she wants a German shepherd, you know? And I'm like, holy (laughs) schmoly. You know, like, I'm like, okay, the house that I get for my new job, I get to, I'm not the headmaster, but I get to live in the headmaster's house is one of my benefits. And it's on a 1,800 acre campus in New Hampshire. So a perfect place for a German shepherd. Right. And so I'm talking to her and I'm like, okay, well, if you want the German shepherd, we're going to have to make some agreements here because mom and I don't want to get stuck with a German shepherd in three or four years if you go to college or something. And You know, if you got a border collie, maybe mom and dad could adopt that in the future, but we're not going German Shepherd. So you'd have to own this thing and you're going to have to feed it and pay for its vet bills. So you're going to have to get a part-time job. You're going to have to get your driver's license when you turn 16 and you're going to have to have a car and you're going to have to be able to pay the payments and mom and dad maybe can do the down payment. And so we're making all these agreements, you know, and I'm like, all you have to do, hon, you can get the German Shepherd and we'll support you, but you're going to have to show me that you can pay for it. You're going to have to show me that you have a vehicle and you can get around to get to your job, to get by dog food, to take your dog to the vet. And you're going to need like some sort of a plan, you know, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to just skip school and go have a business or, you know, my, my daughter is very academically minded. She loves school and she talks about college. And so I'm almost certain she will do the, the whole college thing. And so she's already putting this plan together. You know, she's like, okay, dad, I want to get this Subaru. If you and mom put the down payment, my payment will be 175 a month. If I get a part-time job, here's the minimum wage in New Hampshire. I can work this many hours and easily have enough money. I could even save money, right? And so she's getting so deep and it's all about having a German shepherd, right? But she's like, I could do this online program, dad. I could do college. Here's how I can take tests so I can get a university transcript to get entered into a university before I'm 18 without SAT and or maybe I could do that right and she's just nonstop. and to me that is a perfect example of self-directed learning if she actually gets this dog which is looking like it's going to happen it will teach her so much just through the planning and the execution of having a dog she will learn more through that process than she's learned her entire two years in the school that she goes to right now and I'm not being facetious 
Well, so, it will be stuff that will stick. You know, I oh, mean, absolutely. that's what you were saying about parents. Like, you know, think about what you actually learned, what actually stuck with you, <laughs> you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Like I remember how to fish because I grew up and I loved fishing and I fished all the time, but I don't remember how to do trigonometry and uh, nor do I care. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, your book has been out for a while. What kind of feedback have you received about the message and how do you feel like it's helping other people be more successful? Well, I'm, I'm pleased because when I wrote the book, I didn't think anybody would read it. I even thought about putting it uh, on Amazon for free, but I put it for like the cheapest price you could make a book. It was like I think $2.99. I, I think it's $5 now. I think I raised it up a little bit. And the feedback has been really good. It's got great reviews, almost five stars from everybody, and the feedback is great. And, but in general, what it does and how it helps people is it gives them, like, you know, I'm an educator, so I can talk about this from the perspective of, you know, I, I mean, now I'm a principal of, of the, probably the most successful international school in the entire country of Cambodia. You know, so it's no small situation. So when people see I have a master's degree and then I'm a career educator, but I still have a child and I'm unschooling, that helps. But in the book, I think the personal learner profile is probably the most helpful tool because it's, you've got to get introspective and you've got to figure out who you are as a learner, right? And how mm -hmm. that applies to your life. And you have to reflect back growing up and thinking like, gosh, if I knew and if I could have self-directed my learning, you know, I would probably be, you know, a farmer right now rather than, you know, working as a secretary uh, in, for a law firm or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And so when people can actually look at one, who they are, you know, who they are as a learner, what are their strengths and weaknesses? How do they learn? What do they love to learn? What kind of context do they learn best in? Once they realize, like, whether for better or worse, like how it affected their life, and quite often it's for worse, people realize, and it's kind of depressing, like, gosh, my life is kind of lame and it didn't have to be this way. I feel cheated, right? I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to do this to my own child. It's powerful. And so I think my book does that. It helps parents think like, man, this is ridiculous. I was cheated. I see all this beautiful stuff that I could have done. My kid's doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, and even just finding out who you are, all of a sudden you realize even how to direct your child. I think that's why a lot of parents and, and why it's hard to do schools like this is because a lot of people feel like to do a self-directed education is so like difficult, you know, because it's either like a free for all and you don't care or it's super challenging because, you know, there's not a set curriculum. There's not something that says, oh, now you do this and now you do that and, and that kind of thing. But even if we can start to ask these questions about ourselves, we can be, you know, that consultant <laughs> mindset where we can help our children move towards an education that they would want to get. I mean, if we learn to ask ourselves these questions, then we can help our children better figure out who they want to be too. I mean, as you know, in that mentoring type skill. Does that make yep. sense? Okay. <laughs> it's funny. I'd never heard the consulting parent term before. I haven't read the book that you mentioned yet, but I will put it on my list as soon well, as we get done. <laughs> yeah, listen, or listen to the podcast that's coming out in oh. a couple of days. And then, yeah, yeah, I can, so, I can but, to kick off my, my, my no but, work lifestyle. But it is an excellent book. Um, and they're coming out with another one that's actually going to ask, uh, you know, be able to, um, to um, like a script basically of how to help your children kind of come to this uh, self-driven type of attitude because it is a lot of asking ourselves these questions and then turning it around and helping our kids lead them through with these questions that really make an, a meaningful impact in their life. Speaking Absolutely. of meaningful <laughs> impact, do you feel like that there's something that you've learned that has caused your life to have more meaning and that has helped lead you to your life's mission? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'll just throw it out like a self-directed learning in general, learning about that, learning about the, the principles of liberty really changed who I am as a person in a lot of ways. And I'd say how it's had, you know, it's had a benefit for me inside my profession. I am doing good things inside schools, you know, getting schools away from behaviorism, rewards and punishments into relational ways of being is kind of as close as you can get to like, you know, a, I don't want to call, say self-directed learning, but more of a peaceful parenting approach inside mm -hmm. the classroom. Because if you aren't going to punish kids when they're naughty and you actually have to form a relationship with them, it does magical things. But and when you were just chatting, you, were, you, you made me think of something else I just wanted to mention, which is another simple trick when you're parenting 
or when you're interacting with people is switching from a tell mentality to an ask mentality. And so rather than telling your kids what to do, ask them questions about things. And you step from an authoritarian perspective to an authoritative perspective. And you become that authoritative consultant rather than the mini mm-hmm. dictator of your child. And it's huge. I mean, I, I mean, in the workplace, in the home, everywhere, rather than saying, you know, oh, go do the dishes. Be like, uh, hey, hon, if you don't have you know, much to do, I'm really busy today. Would you mind helping me with the dishes? The same end goal, but such a different way to approach it. And so, you know, getting back to the original question of like things that have changed my life, understanding liberty is probably the most significant. And that ties into everything that I do and have changed from kind of more of a typical New England left wing hippie social justice warrior (laughs) guy to like, no, it's all about freedom. And let's get serious about world peace and talk the non-aggression principle because you hippies are talking garbage and you really need to upgrade your understanding here. And so I'll just leave it at that. But freedom is where it's at, man. That's, that's the stuff. Yeah. And moving that into like liberating our, our own people, you know, liberating where we can in our own homes with our own children, I think is a good way to start. Well, and let's talk about maybe habits that you feel like in your personal life are really helpful to better learning. Um, You already talked about, you know, asking those questions, trying to figure out who you are, changing that social conditioning through that de-schooling process. But do you feel like there are any other habits that help for better learning? Yeah, I mean, there's so much I could say on that. But, you know, one thing is like for parents, focus on your passions, right? We all have to go out and make some money or most of us, I guess, do have to do that, right? So you've got Mm -hmm. a professional life and maybe it's passion-based, but I'm assuming for the most part, most people aren't in a passion-based job. They're just doing (laughs) a job like all of us to pull down some money and put food on the table. But if you really like, you know, music and you've never played music, go learn a musical instrument. If you like digging around in the dirt and gardening, have a garden. If you like sewing, sew. If you like, uh, you know, being around people during church groups or, you know, whatever is available in your, in your neighborhood. But nurture your passions because if you're going to be a positive role model for a child, you have to be a lifelong learner engrossed in your passions to be that role model Mm -hmm. for your child. So I think that is a big thing that I think can help because once you become a passion-based learner, it's easy to help guide your child and and assist your child or consult your child in that way. And I can give you an example. I mean, I've been a musician forever. And when my daughter was a little girl, she always used to love to sing in the car, just making up words. And so she's always been very musically inclined. And ever since she was a little kid, you know, I would hold my guitar and I would make the chords with my hand, but I would let her strum the guitar and she just would light up and it was like magic. And then when she was, I think seven, she, she wanted to learn music. So she's like, dad, I want to learn guitar. And I was like, well, have you ever thought about ukulele? Because the guitar is kind of big for you. I don't even know if you can get your arms around it. And so she wanted not just a ukulele, dad, but a purple ukulele. (laughs) So I got her a purple ukulele for her birthday. And I learned how to play it really quick. It was very easy for me. And so I started teaching her and she started playing music. And then I started getting her piano lessons. And she grew up and I, you know, I would play like rock and roll songs and she would sing the words and stuff. And so she just kind of grew up like engrossed in my passion based thing with music. I mean, you know, and now she's like, she sings like the wind. She's in the choir. She plays piano. She plays ukulele. She's really deep into music. And so, you know, that kind of like walking the walk, I guess, is a simple way to put it. You can go, oh, I'm a big self-directed learner, right? And I'm going to do this. But if you just go to work and come home and, oh, another sucky day at the office and, you know, uh, and you're just stewing around about how crappy your life is and you're not actually enjoying your passions and learning new things and showing your child that, like, it doesn't end. I mean, you know, I'm getting into new stuff all the time. And so, like, you have to live it and breathe it so you can model it for your child as well as enabling and creating the opportunity for your child as well. I agree. I, I think I've done more to teach my children by example than I ever said to them. You know, it's, it goes back to that, you know, walk the walk or live the way that you want, you know, everybody around you to live because people are more inspired by that necessarily than, than the words that you say in a lot of ways. Um, 
that's what when my kids watch me do this podcast or my husband sews hammocks or something like that that yeah. that teaches them more about life than you know any lecture that we give to them so i agree like we've got to walk the walk and be yep. the parents that we want our kids to be yeah that's great exactly. well, <laughs> well, tell me about your long-term goals I and mean, you're moving to New Hampshire and stuff, but what do your goals look like for the future and how is that going to work into a legacy that you hope to leave? That's a great question. And like six months ago, I had a really good answer for you, but now with the whole <laughs> COVID thing, it's yeah. hard to think long-term. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I really love my job here and, and I would have been happy to stay, but it doesn't pay as well as I'd like. And so you know, in November, I was like, you know, you got to give me a contract so I know what you're offering. And they didn't want to offer anywhere near what I wanted, which was fine. And I had already been talking to uh, this woman in Thailand, Padma Fisher, who I've been talking to since 2013. And she opened a little international school in Hua Hin, Thailand, which is south of Bangkok, about three, four hours, right on the beach, tropical paradise, you know, great place. My wife and I were engaged in this town, so it's a special place for us. And so I was going to go and, and work for them and then work full time helping them with their school. And they only go from kindergarten to grade six. She doesn't want anything to do with anything after grade six. So I went over there in late February and was you know, going to take the job working for them. And then at the same time, opened my own either learning center or school, a completely self-directed program for kids who are, you know, say grade seven or teenagers until they're either off the university or off into some life or whatever. But when COVID got serious, like the school is on the rocks, you know, they, they might not financially survive this mm -hmm. thing. So them hiring me was becoming iffy. Me opening a school was definitely, I'm like, I'm definitely not going to go and put money into an investment right now. A lot of these parents who are going to invest with me are like, my gosh, we're going to go broke. We have to go back to Europe or America and get jobs again. And, you know, people's lives are really changing. So all of a sudden I was like, well, crap, now I don't have a job lined up for next year. So I started putting my CV out. And luckily, this woman who I had spoke to over Christmas when I was in the States visiting is uh, the principal of Hampshire Country School, which is a, a school for, for boys. It used to be co-ed, but it's for, they, they describe their student population as high energy, high intelligence boys. So you're talking like the ADHD, the oppositional defiant, um, uh, Asperger's, maybe even autism, right? Yeah. Which is an interesting population. I mean, I, I actually think these are like the gems of humanity and it's a teaching disability and that causes them problems. Nothing wrong with them. It's, yeah. it's the system. But anyway, I, I've been talking to this lady and she said, look, we want to hire you to build a self-directed program. Can you do that for us? And I'm like, thank you, Lord. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> um, what I wanted. Yeah. It's what I need. I, I, I really need to believe what I do. So our, our plan, my wife and I were looking at like, okay, maybe we start a school in Thailand and, you know, and then do semi-retirement, you know, like in five or 10 years. But we don't know what to think right now. So I've got this great job. I'm going to be building a self-directed learning program, working with some highly enlightened, beautiful people. I mean, this woman I talked to, Liz, is just, it's like candy having a conversation with her. Oh, cool. um, so we're going to go there and, and, you know, our daughter's 15. And so we're looking at three to five years before she flies the coop, so to speak. And so what are we going to do after that? And, you know, as much as I love education, I think I'm done. You know, maybe I might write some more books and I'll stay active in the, in the self-directed community, but I want to go back into my pottery. And my wife is a Thai chef. She is a gifted woman mm -hmm. when it comes to making things that taste delicious. So we're not quite sure we were thinking of doing six months in New England, six months in Thailand, and having a couple of different businesses and stuff. But we really can't think about the future. We don't, I mean, that's uh, kind of hard. To... Oh, it's a whole nother podcast to talk about. COVID <laughs> from, my, from my experience in Cambodia, it's just fascinating, like what we've dealt with here. And I won't go into it, but tourism is being destroyed over here right now. And that is going to kill the economies over here. It's going to kill the way of life over here um, mm. in Southeast Asia because they're so dependent on tourism. And we can't think about having a tourist related business in New England in the summers if there's no tourism happening and same uh. in Thailand. And so we don't know. We'd like to live in a place where it's warm. Even though I'm moving to New Hampshire, I'm not a big fan of winter and snow and all that. I grew up, I loved it. But after almost 20 years in the tropics, I'm a tropical guy now. <laughs> yeah. um, so we don't know. I mean, if things are really bad and, and there's no options, maybe we'll move to a place like Arizona or Florida. If Thailand's in a full military dictatorship right now, so us going there is looking 
you know, less and less, unless they oust the current, you know, dictators in power, it's looking bad for Thailand. So we're not mm, sure about what to good. think about that. Cambodia is a great place to live, but the government's insane here. And, and so it's hard to plan. Mexico, maybe. I mean, we don't know. Yeah. But our general goal is I want to start making pottery again. My wife wants to get a little restaurant or a food truck and, you know, and kind of just live the good life. And, and you know, because I've worked really hard until now and I'm, I'm ready to go back into my art. I'm, a, I'm an artist more than anything else. That's cool. Well, yeah. like you said, we always have to have our own passions and stuff uh, leading our direction. So that's great. Yep. Well, give us yep. some final parting advice for our listeners and then give us your contact information. Tell us how we can get a hold of your book. Okay. Well, my book's on Amazon, on the ebook, and then the audio book, like I mentioned, should be out there pretty soon. You can find me on Facebook, but you have to dig around because there's a famous Mark Beaumont who, mm -hmm. who like, is a cyclist and, and he actually has a TED talk and talks about like self-directed or passion-based learning. I'm like, how bizarre to have another Mark Beaumont who's talking about <laughs> passion-based learning in this world. But he kind of like is so big, he like kind of buries me. So if you can't find me on Facebook, I have an email address called standupandunschool at gmail.com. And that's the one connected to my Facebook. So it's just all one word, all lowercase, no dots or, or spaces or anything. Stand up and unschool at gmail.com. You can email me there or you can find me on Facebook uh, there. I'm on Float and I, I have. Uh, I've never even heard of Float. Twitter That's and, interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's a, a censorship free kind of Facebook thing. Well, I should um, probably be I've on got, that. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get everybody. It's slowly but surely people are trickling over. We got to abandon and leave that horrible thing called Facebook to its death where it belongs because it's, you know, if it's not a CIA operation, it might as well be because that seems to be what it's working like right now. Yeah. Um, but without getting into that, I have Instagram and stuff, but I, I don't check in. I, I have Twitter. I almost never look at it. I'm, you know, like my daughter says, it's like, dad, old people use Facebook. Young people use, you know, Instagram or whatever. I'm like, oh, thanks, hon. So anyway, <laughs> that's where I'm at. That's how I can be found, you know, and parting thoughts is there's some really, really great books out there. And, and like I said, unschooling yourself first is really important to educate yourself. So I would highly recommend uh, Carrie McDonald's new book. And it's a long title, which I can, it's like, unschooling, raising, self-aware, you know, well-adjusted <laughs> kids outside of the conventional classroom or something like that. But that's a beautiful piece of literature. And Peter Gray's Free to Learn. Yeah, although that's I, a great I, one. Oh, it's just beautiful. And, and his Psychology Today blog that he has, just beautiful stuff. I mean, those two, and then a, a new guy, kind of, not new, but he's really getting a big voice now is Corey DeAngelis. Yeah. Um, and he's an, an academic researcher. Those three, go get their books, go read up on them, go follow them. Because to me, like, I want to brag on myself and say, oh, yeah, you know, go read my book. Yeah, please go read my book. But these people are like, you know, our biggest voices in self-directed learning. They are PhD. Well, Carrie's not a PhD, but, but uh, Peter Gray and Corey DeAngelis are. But Carrie might as well have a PhD. I mean, her research and her way of explaining things is just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. The three of them. And I see them as the three crown jewels of, of self-directed learning. Uh, John Taylor Gatto is another guy I would mention. He's got videos. He's got books. Very powerful information. Charlotte Iserby also has some YouTube videos where she talks about kind of the history of school. She was a senior policy writer for the Department of Education. And her father or her husband or both were from Skull and Bones. Fascinating lady. Um, and I can keep naming people, but get <laughs> out there. Get yeah. out there and start looking for books and resources and blogs and people to follow. Libertarian Homeschooler, absolutely wonderful resource. Your blog, uh, Anarchast, Disenthrall. I mean, there's so many out there that you can just tap into and start getting regular information from people who are, are like you and I. We've been in this for a while. We're deep. We've got things to talk about. Exactly. Um, and that, I'll just leave it at that. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's been fun. Again, we've been talking with Mark Bowman. His book that we discussed was Unschool Yourself First, A Parent's Gateway to Self-Directed Learning. I'm going to be sure to tag all of that, the Facebook and the media that he talked about on our show notes as well. But thank you so much, Mark, for coming on to The Luminous Mind and talking to us everything from government to parenting to educating. Um, I think we discussed everything. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. It's a really lovely conversation. So thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. 
Music featured in this episode from Scott Holmes. To learn more about our podcast, check us out at theluminousmind.net.